Chapter 15 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy in Paris by Henry Greville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 15. He Comes. One night, while the orchestra was playing the prelude to her first ballad, she ran over the audience with indolent eyes, for she had become accustomed to the fiery barrier of the footlights. She was never timid, but sure of herself, liked to examine her public, and possibly select some especial persons to whom to sing. Her heart gave a wild, tumultuous leap, as she caught sight of a young man who was watching her with fixed attention. He sat leaning back in his chair against a mass of dark green foliage. His large, dark eyes were full of fire, and totally different from those of the men whom she was in the habit of seeing. They were neither weary and faded from sleeplessness, nor reddened by dissipation. The girl's lips paled as she met these eyes, but it was time for her to sing. She finished the first verse, and as she turned the page again, Bonne Marie glanced once more at the stranger. He had listened attentively. Indeed, he leaned forward and fixed his eyes on her. "'He has come,' said Bonne Marie. "'The man I am to love has come.' With what intensity of feeling she sang the words of the next couplet, and in them addressed the stranger." who had entered thus suddenly into her life, only those who know something of the enthusiasm of a pure, romantic young girl can imagine. The unknown was carefully dressed and singularly handsome. Of course, therefore, he must be endowed with every virtue and every merit. His admiration of Bonne Marie was very evident and unmistakable, and yet she fancied she read in his face something more than admiration, curiosity and astonishment. It is astonishing. It seemed to say, she is pretty, very pretty. She sings here, and yet she has not the face or the air for a casino. The unknown called a waiter, gave him a card, and slipped something into his hand as the young girl sang her third and last verse. When she ended, she bowed and curtsied gravely to the enthusiastic audience. The man she had been looking at rose to his feet and applauded her with his gloved hands. With difficulty, she guarded herself against thanking him with a look being warned by a secret instinct. When she returned to her dressing room, she received a bouquet of white blossoms, and with it a card. This card, which she looked at with some hesitation, was inscribed with the name Louis Maurin. He was not able, he was not noble, as they say in the country. The stranger was a mere plebeian. But what did that matter if he had the true nobility of soul and good manners? These were Bon Marie's these were Bonne Marie's reflections, and she was quite ready to forgive anything in the man to whom she had never yet once spoken. The next night Louise Maureen was in the same place, and when Mademoiselle Lucien curtsied low in reply to the applause, he bowed to her. His bow was both familiar and respectful, and Mademoiselle Lucien colored and sang with a less assured voice than usual. Later in the evening a white bouquet precisely like the one of the evening before was handed to her. She had received many bouquets, all had pleased her. She had received many bouquets, all had pleased her, but none had agitated her. This one brought back all her past, all her dreams of love and of fame. It was precisely thus she had pictured to herself the coming of her lover. He would see her some night, and he would dare to speak to her. Finally, his lips would be unsealed, and a heaven on earth would enroll before them, through a marriage where love would be eternal. If Louise Maureen had known all that was in Bonne Marie's heart at that moment, he would probably have postponed the presentation that he had eagerly asked. But he believed her to be very different from what she really was. He thought her a mere concert singer like many another, having possibly a little more education, but who had little reputation or virtue to lose. In his eyes, Bonne Marie was a pretty person, extremely charming, and with a natural air of distinction but who was quite as capable of devouring a man's fortune as any one of her associates. While Bonne Marie, therefore, was dreaming of a fortune that could not be far distant, Louise Maureen made more prosaic reflections, of which the result was that on the fourth day, having not received, not having received even a glance of encouragement, and yet with an intuitive certainty of having been remarked, the young man waited outside the enclosure until the noisy artists had all departed. Ten minutes later, the young girl in black, and with close round hat, came out. At first, he hardly recognized her in this costume, but a second look reassured him, and he bowed profoundly. 
at the moment when he was about to utter words of which at the moment when he was about to utter words which he could never repair he saw bonne marie return his salutation with timidity and haste she dropped her veil over her face all glowing with blushes and passed on quickly he stood in mute surprise forgetting to put on his hat and when he came to his senses the girl was far away he turned and followed her but he was too late she was out of sight the next day he was near the entrance long before it was time for the concert to open he sat on the same bench where bonne marie had sat on that day when she saw clotilde and waited with his white bouquet in hand he did not care in the least for the fact that his bouquet and himself were attracting considerable attention and ridicule he determined to see again and nearer too that pretty timid face she does not look in the least as if she belonged to this profession he said to himself and i believe there is some romance in connection with her i intend to find it out end of chapter 15 recording by susanna mason chapter 16 of bonne marie this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henri Creville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 16. The Painter. Louis Morin was what the world calls a charming fellow. He was amiable, obliging, and yet by no means without a goodly share of masculine selfishness, he was generally gay but sometimes morose and suspicious but these last qualities were suspected only by the few persons who knew him intimately perhaps friendly reader you may have known some of these charming fellows who are at the back and bidding of their lady friends always willing to execute a commission obliging to a degree with a purse whose strings slide easily who always have a word of consolation and encouragement for the downcast who in short are always thoughtful and agreeable in society but in their homes they are changed beings no one must ask them for the smallest assistance everything annoys and fatigues them they have no money the chimney smokes they growl at their wives and snap at the servants you need not call them hypocrites, for they are nothing of the kind. They simply have a fixed idea that it is the height of folly to take any trouble for one's family and prefer to reserve all their amiability for the families of other men. Ask of kind heaven, therefore, that these amiable youths may never come to regard you as one of themselves. Louis Morin was a painter after struggling for four or five years and exhibiting at each salon extremely clever pictures conscientiously painted but whose subjects were rather serious and productive of little attention and no money he at last struck out on a new path and painted extremely ugly groups of men drinking and carousing these were full of faults but they caught the eye he did not send these to the salon for they would have been rejected with holy horror and just indignation but he put them into the hands of picture dealers and found they were quickly bought by amateurs possibly from the same mysterious reason which makes people think those frightful bulldog pictures beautiful each canvas brought him fifty francs and as he painted six monthly the amount they brought in per annum was not to be despised one day however it came to pass that as he was looking at his last work displayed in the window of a picture dealer he saw a gentleman enter the shop and ask to see it he examined it and finally purchased it and apparently fearing that he should lose the precious object he walked out of the shop with it under his arm Morin, outside in the street had witnessed the whole scene and stopped the amateur as soon as he reached the sidewalk i beg your pardon sir he said but will you tell me how much you have just paid for that picture the man stared but answered slowly five hundred francs 
with a frame the amateur was more amazed than before but he answered murkly yes with the frame and it was not dear replied morin enthusiastically and now sir let me tell you that it is i who paint these pictures and if you want any more i will paint them for you at four hundred francs with a frame and you to choose the subject and bowing politely to the amateur morin handed him his card and disappeared louis morin read the man yes that is the signature and this is his address i do not understand it is some joke i suppose but still i think i will call there to-morrow and thus it was that louis morin began to make his fortune at last as well as reputation from time to time he said to himself i should like to do some work worthy of the salon but life is very delightful in paris when one has almost as much money as one wants and to accomplish anything of value would have taken six months while in those same six months morin painted ten little horrors which each brought him in eight hundred francs it is easy therefore to see why he sent nothing more to the salon the prize of the bouquets of white lilacs was therefore not as appalling to him as to many another and besides he had discovered a florist who sold them at a comparatively low price thanks to the politeness and the gaiety of the young artist who one day drew the woman's poetry with ten strokes of his pencil perhaps after all that is the thing i can do best said morin sadly as he contemplated the full red face of this fifty-year-old woman who had no longer the smallest pretensions to good looks i see i was born to paint portraits the day he sat waiting for bonne marie armed with his white lilacs he suddenly had an original idea i will ask to paint her portrait he said to himself she cannot refuse that and i will send it to the salon this new notion delighted a young artist for in every way it could not fail to be profitable to him he did not care to throw away his time be it understood by my readers about eight o'clock morin saw bonne marie approaching in the misty september twilight she was dressed with the same simplicity as on the previous evening and wore in her breast a spray of white lilac as she saw the young artist she started back mademoiselle he said as he presented his bouquet will you not condescend to accept from my own hands the flowers which hitherto you have not refused and his eyes rested on the spray that trembled on the girl's corsage she silently took the bouquet thanks she said in a low voice as she moved on he stopped her mademoiselle lucienne your beauty is as wonderful as your talent and bonne marie blushing like a rose turned her face away with a smile to any other person this phrase would probably have seemed the merest commonplace but to her it was the most welcome and sincerest praise and therefore continued the young artist there should be a portrait painted of you which when you are no longer young you will like to look at and of which you may be proud all your life long bonne marie turned her lovely eyes on morin their blue depths were far less serene than usual my portrait she said but who will paint it i mademoiselle if you will permit me he was standing with uncovered head addressing her as if she were his sovereign the ambitious young girl remembered that she had seen pictures of handsome youth who thus accosted great ladies and her pride was greatly flattered i do not know sir she replied you would not refuse me mademoiselle he cried this portrait may be the glory of my career and i count upon it to convince the frequenters of the next saloon and i am one of the first painters of the epoch louis morin was not modest most assuredly but then he made no pretensions to being so and this fact should induce any one to pardon this egoistically outburst bonne marie did not understand and she repeated vaguely the salon what salon 
the exhibition of pictures answered morin somewhat surprised at the ignorance of the charming singer and when will this exhibition take place continued bonne marie timidly in the spring answered morin more and more astonished the girl hesitated your proposition is most flattering she said at last but i cannot yet say whether i can accept it you would not be hard-hearted enough to refuse i am sure exclaimed the painter the discordant sounds of the orchestra tuning their instruments recalled bonne marie to a recollection of the duties of the present hour i neither refuse nor accept now she said hastily i must think about it but sir i cannot pay for this portrait pay for the portrait interrupted the young man the more eagerly that he had not foreseen this resistance did i not say that i relied on this work to give me name and fame it is i who will be forever indebted to you we will see said bonne marie and saluting him with a gracious bow she glided past him and disappeared End of chapter sixteen recording by monica raleigh chapter seventeen of bon marie this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by monica raleigh bon marie a tale of normandy and paris by henri greville translated by mary neil shearwood chapter seventeen the portrait when bon marie appeared on the stage a half hour later the painter was in the place where she had already learned to look for him she avoided meeting his eyes but she wore in her hair or her breast and carried in her hand the white lilacs he had given her my portrait murmured bonne marie when she was alone in her own room after midnight my portrait at the exhibition he counts on that to create a reputation for himself from his air and manner one would suppose his reputation already made he has the air of a celebrity what must i say shall it be yes ah to have him paint my portrait would be bliss indeed these thoughts kept her awake until three o'clock and finally bonne marie fell asleep deciding to go the next day and consult clotilde just at ten o'clock she rang at her friend's door and was received by clotilde in her dressing-gown the relations between them were as friendly as heretofore if not quite as familiar clotilde was born to protect the weak and as bonne marie could now take care of herself and her wings had grown strong clotilde lost some portion of the interest she had formerly taken in her just at this time too clotilde was occupied in pushing a young seamstress in whom she had discovered positive genius she shall be the fashion she said to herself and clotilde generally carried her point tell me said bonne marie tell me what the salon is i am so ignorant that i commit a dozen blunders every day the salon oh you mean the exhibition yes i presume so but the exhibition of what of painting and sculpture did you not know that no not that nor many another thing beside tell me more about this exhibition clotilde not without a good-natured laugh at the ignorance of her friend explained all the mysteries of the salon and naturally as she knew many of the useful artists she cheered at the committee but why on earth are you so deeply interested in the salon all at once it is because some one answered bonne marie with considerable hesitation has proposed to paint my portrait for the salon how splendid cried clotilde your portrait at the exhibition why my dear it would make you known throughout paris in forty-eight hours no one ever made such a proposal to me and yet i flatter myself i am no uglier than you if i am not guilty of an indiscretion may i ask who it is who wishes to paint your portrait 
bonne marie intensely annoyed at the smile on clodille's lips answered coldly there is no indiscretion in your question it is monsieur louis morin louis morin don't know him replied clotilde with an air of supreme indifference she did not speak the truth however but what could you expect no artist had asked to paint her portrait for the salon bonne marie did not speak for a moment shall i accept she said at last in a voice she endeavoured to render steady clotilde was quite ashamed of herself by this time her kindness of heart prompted her to encourage her timid friend besides should she advise bonne marie to refuse there would be plenty of malicious tongues ready to say she did so from envy except my child of course you must it is a splendid thing as i told you before but tell me added the diva mischievously is this louis morin the young prince for whom you have been waiting bonne marie turned away half angrily and clotilde was more delighted than before never mind she cried if he be prince by birth or prince of artists the essential is that you love him when will you invite me to the wedding seeing that she had seriously annoyed her friend clotilde took her by the arm and drew her towards her is it so serious as this she asked gently i know nothing about it answered bonne marie carried away by that need to open her heart which is one of the most charming qualities and also one of the greatest follies of youth i only know that he asked if he might paint my portrait but why did you not say yes at once asked clotilde with a smile you would have accepted then with joy and gratitude my child i would in fact have kissed him on both cheeks and bade him fix the hour for the first sitting but where would he paint this portrait asked bonne marie good heavens child where on earth would he paint it if not in his studio would you have him do it in a cellar in his own rooms do you mean a studio does not necessarily mean where your artist lives it is generally a neutral territory where all the world assembles but bless my heart where did you get all these prudish notions are they prudish notions asked the girl much troubled of course they are what on earth does it matter if you love him bonne marie plucked up her courage spurred by the dread of betraying her secret but i do not love him she said firmly well then you will it amounts to the same thing you will marry him and i shall dance at your wedding why can't you be serious said the girl as she rose to depart simply my dear because i am not cut out of that sort of stuff we are entirely different i try occasionally but it is really no use j'ai quitté ma soeur au berceau she began singing lucien's ballade with a nasal whine her friend smiled she could not help it and the two laughed heartily together just as they were separating clotilde exclaimed ah i forgot do you want a dressmaker no why but who makes your dresses persisted the diva as she held the door half open the woman you sent to me her taste is wretched try little Ersen. she is a genius as you will soon discover if you employ her but said bonne marie i can't afford to have many dresses my salary is only six thousand francs per annum the door that clotilde held clapped to with a bang i have vexed her said bonne marie to herself and yet i had no intention of doing so i wonder if a day could by any chance elapse without me being guilty of some gross piece of stupidity as she entered the house where she resided the old concierge followed her up the stairs this worthy woman professed the greatest respect for the young singer she never receives a single visit she said and she always comes straight home from the concert the emphasis laid upon this fact led the hearer to infer that all the lodgers did not pique themselves on similar regularity but this concerns neither my readers nor myself mademoiselle said to cerberus in petticoats some one has been here for you for me answered bonne marie in surprise you must be mistaken not i it was a very good-looking young man and he left his card beside the young girl took the card which it is unnecessary to state bore the name of louis morin 
i'm very much obliged to you madame she said in considerable confusion what shall i say to him when he comes again asked the woman with a knowing air nothing at all answered bonne marie as she ran lightly up the stairs the concierge looked after her and then with a significant shrug of her shoulders she returned to her room where had morin obtained her address this was the question that now troubled our artless little girl it never occurred to her that nothing was easier than to obtain it at the theatre bonne marie had learned many things but she did not yet know that an address can be purchased she fancied that he had taken the less commonplace method and had followed her home and her heart beat high with joy and gratified vanity he laughed her then already and would he not love her more when he knew her real value the girl fully realized that the people by whom she was surrounded were not models of virtue but she never supposed that a single human being could doubt her honor piety and virtue were so entirely the rules that governed her life that she had no idea that any one could misjudge her if morin loved her it must be that he wished to take her his wife and if he loved her merely because he had seen and heard her what would be the surprise of the young painter when he discovered that she possessed those domestic virtues whose worth she estimated at their full value she fancied herself in his atelier an atelier what was that sometimes in her walks she had looked up to those high windows far above all the other houses and had asked herself what was done in those cages half darkened by heavy curtains of green serge the words studio atelier and painter told her little more than she knew before was she about to enter one of these mysterious retreats she saw her own image smiling down at her from the wall resplendent with youth and beauty she saw the crowd pressing toward it and she heard her name repeated in a hundred different tones of admiration it is too much cried bonne marie intoxicated with joy it seems impossible her doorbell rang gently and recalled her to real life she opened the door louis morin stood before her forgive my importunity mademoiselle said the young man i ventured to come back because i was told that you were always alone there was something in this phrase which jarred on bonne marie it might have been that it fell coldly on the chorus of happy voices to which she had been listening like a false note on seeing the light frown that contracted her delicate eyebrows morin felt he had made a blunder he spoke again therefore with greater caution the artist mademoiselle comes to ask his model to fix an hour for the first sitting had you friends with you i should have deferred my request particularly as you have not given me your promise come in sir said bonne marie and she preceded her guest to her small faded salon will you say monday asked morin in a pleading voice the girl still hesitated the painter asking himself what argument he could use had a happy inspiration i shall receive you without any ceremony and one or two friends will be with me as soon as she found that morin would not be alone in his studio bonne marie made no further objection very well she said i agree to monday the idea of the portrait makes me possibly a little indiscreet but indiscreet interrupted morin how can it be indiscreet when your beauty and your talent are already recognized by the public but now that we are good friends tell me under what happy sky you were born and where is the casket that has hitherto concealed this pearl bonne marie had no reason for concealment or disguise and yet as she was about to tell this stranger where she was born she had a vague feeling of terror and reluctance she could not lie however her natural shrewdness born of the common sense of normandy suggested a way out of this difficulty i was born in normandy she said on the seashore but you would not be interested in the details ah thought morin you do not wish me to know whence you come just as you please have you ever said to any one he asked aloud never we will try and prevent you from finding it too wearisome for it certainly is a very stupid thing to do 
Bonne Marie's eyes said very clearly that she should not find it wearisome. But the painter could not discover anything especially flattering to himself in this declaration. The girl rose, and Morin saw himself obliged to cut his visit short. On Monday, then, he said, and shall it be at one o'clock? Just as you please, sir, she answered. You have my address, and we live very near each other, said Louis Morin, and as he reached the door, he extended his hand to the young girl, who frankly placed hers within it. He had intended to raise it to his lips, but a cool little hand met his with such utter indifference that he was not tempted to commit any such folly. He therefore shook it as he would have done that of some masculine friend, and departed. As he went down the stairs, he said to himself, that is an odd sort of girl. One can't precisely say that she's acting a part, and yet, upon my word, I don't understand her. End of chapter 17 Recording by Monica Rolly. Chapter 18 of Bonne Marie this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. Bonne Marie, a tale of Normandy and Paris by Henri Greville. Translated by Marianne Neil Sherwood. Chapter 18. The Studio. Monday came. Bonne Marie took her place on the elevated platform in the soft, subdued light of the atelier. With a sheet of music in her hand, she stood erect, her black dress, for she still wore mourning for her father, fell in soft folds around her graceful figure. Happy and yet anxious, she followed each movement of the artist with intense curiosity. He stood before her and made strange lines on his canvas. Contrary to his words to Bonne Marie, they were alone in his studio, for he preferred to make the preliminary sketch and fix on the pose, without the advice of friends, advice which generally leaves one out of temper and bewildered. He spoke to her occasionally as he worked to prevent her from feeling weary. Bonne Marie rarely opened her lips, except to answer a direct question and her replies revealed such an extraordinary ignorance of the world that more than once the artist dropped his crayon and looked earnestly at his model. She must be laughing at me, he thought, but the pure serene face of Bonne Marie excluded this idea. No one plays a joke with such a calm, angelic look. More puzzled than ever, the young man resumed his sketch with renewed energy. At last, he exclaimed, turning his easel toward her. She stepped from the platform and ran to look. Was that her portrait? Did those black lines on that grey ground represent her image? She stood silent and disappointed. Morin laughed. You can see nothing, he said good-naturedly. Well, never mind, it will come. Now, will you dine with me? Bonne Marie shook her head. Just as you please. I make it a rule never to contradict anyone. Tomorrow, then, at the same hour. Will you be at the concert tonight? asked the girl with some hesitation. Most assuredly, answered Morin eagerly. Farewell, then, for the present, said Bonne Marie as she put on her hat. You're not going away so soon. Can we not talk a little? No, not today, when we know each other better. But I know you now very well, cried Morin, snatching her hand and leading her to the easel again. Shall I tell you your history? She looked at him with widely open eyes of surprise. You were brought up in the country, began the artist. You have had a good education, too good for the life you were to lead. You were ennuyé where you were, and finally you came to Paris to see if you could not make more of your life here then in your country. Is not that so? Yes, it is all true, murmured the girl, overwhelmed at this wonderful clear-sightedness. To her, the young man's words had far other meaning than they seemed to have, and to him 
they were different still how were they ever to understand each other when the same word bore to each a different meaning and value you see i know you thoroughly continued morin and you will quickly learn to know me too i am an honest fellow i like all that tends to make life agreeable i am an honourable man and i love you mademoiselle lucien no answered bonne marie growing very pale do not tell me so i entreat of you but i must tell you because i wish you to understand me say no more replied the young girl you are painting my portrait now must i wait until the portrait is finished i shall have to work at full gallop then do not hurry answered bonne marie smiling there is ample time she left the room trembling from head to foot happy in being loved but troubled that the young man should have spoken thus lightly End of chapter eighteen recording by monica raleigh chapter nineteen of bonne marie this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by monica raleigh bonne marie a tale of normandy and paris by henri greville translated by mary neil sherwood chapter nineteen how pictures are made the next morning some little time before the hour fixed for the sitting morin was trying to dismiss the friends in his studio look here boys he said lucien is a very well-bred person you and your smoking caps will frighten her out of her wits go away the two youths to whom he addressed these conciliatory words were two brother artists whose studios were on the same floor with his own they talked rather than toiled and spent most of their time lounging in morin's quarters there they complained of the blundering idiots who did not understand them of the poor light in their studios of the jews of dealers who bought their pictures for nothing and sent them to america where they sold for preposterous prices these complaints disposed of they discussed the secrets of their art one of them called himself a realist and the other colorist no one could understand why as there was no obvious difference they imitated each other without intending to do so and the canvas differed only in the signatures one day the colorist said to his comrade you remember your sketch le moulin de la galette it is very good do you know good it is a masterpiece listen a wealthy merchant ordered a landscape of me to be delivered to-night lend me your moulin i will sign it and my patron will give me a hundred francs a hundred francs you understand and to-morrow i will paint you a view from montmartre do this and we will have a good supper to-night the colorist consented and a few days later he signed the montmartre picture and sold it for a hundred and fifty francs go away my good friends i beg of you repeated morin in a dismissal tone but we wish to see your lucien you sent us off yesterday and you can't play the same game two days in succession no we won't go until we have seen her then go and make yourselves respectable respectable oh you mean in our dress is she a princess do it for me boys how can you make such asses of yourselves we obey but swear you will let us in again i swear only one condition however that you will conduct yourself with propriety while she is here never fear we will be as solemn as members of the institute bonne marie came in a few minutes and found morin on the arms his brush in his hand upon his clear and shining palette white and ultramarine naples yellow ochre and bitumen were arranged in regular drops in a half circle the young girl looked curiously at these patches out of which the delicacy of her pearly skin the brilliancy of her dewy eyes and the sweet freshness of her lovely mouth were to be reproduced how was this marvellous work to be accomplished what mysterious power 
would indicate to the artist what atoms of colour he should take on the point of his pencil to depict on that dull canvas a living image of the face at which she had so often gazed in her gold-framed mirror morin dressed in black velvet wearing a cap of the same looked like one of the painters of the renaissance and affected the girl as to be sure he always did as a being of a superior sphere she felt ignorant childish and weak in his presence and was afraid to meet his eyes are you alone she said after greeting him hastily morin divined her meaning yes alone he said gaily with that air of good nature which was one of his distinguishing characteristics but i fear i shall not long enjoy the pleasure of a tete-a-tete -tete with you my studio is rarely empty had you come five minutes earlier you would have found it crowded and i wag my life that in less than five minutes some one will come and disturb us a bright smile flitted over bonne marie's face who is likely to come she asked any one and every one amateurs picture dealers and friends my doors are always open ever since a very poor jest of one of my comrades ruined my bell a poor jest repeated the girl she had rashly supposed this vast room which affected her like a church was no place for jests upon these high walls were fastened fragments of classic phrygies a plaster statue of the venus of milo sketches and landscapes several heads copies from some of the earlier painters for example the wonderful madonna of botticelli du louvre all these souvenirs of a far-away past all these treasures of art which people vaguely admire without in the least comprehending filled bonne marie with respectful admiration while at the same time they impressed more fully on her mind that the master of this mysterious spot lived in ideal regions far away from dull humanity look said morin pointing with his brush to the wall above the door bonne marie looked and beheld a small doll whose limbs covered with pink kid dangled helplessly from the bell wherein its head and shoulders had been mercilessly thrust i needed a ladder to take it out said morin with a lazy smile and i had none consequently my atelier is as public as any open square in the city but if it disturbs you not in the least said bonne marie eagerly the sitting began and at the end of fifteen minutes the two curious neighbours made the prophesied eruption into the studio we beg ten thousand pardons do not let us disturb you they said with the most serious air not at all come in mademoiselle lucien will permit me to receive you what have you there continued morin addressing the colorist my last panel an order my dear fellow i am not displeased with it on the whole either the colorist exhibited a piece of white board about as large as his two hands on which was represented in their full size a jar of blue faience on a yellow plate across which was a silver spoon this is the application of my general principle of aesthetics pray explain said bonne marie with some curiosity forgetting her pose and turning her head to look at this chef-d'oeuvre i am only too happy mademoiselle too happy my principle then although somewhat short comprises the whole of art all in all and all everywhere i have heard that before i think interrupted morin with that everlasting smile of his which verged something on the consumptuous probably but mademoiselle has not been equally fortunate i imagine this principle which eugene de la croix stated has become my maxim without it there can be no true art for painting is colour and colour is harmony now all pictures are harmonious are chef-d'oeuvre do you see in nature all tints are mingled harmoniously that is why delacroix put blue in his flesh tints and flesh tints in his skies and you will admit that he was a most wonderful colorist but why have you put that blue spot in the bowl of your spoon asked morin it is a reflection of the sweet meat jar but your spoon is not at the right angle to catch this reflection ah yes true then it is the reflection from the sky but where do you get it through my window of course indeed in autumn 
it strikes me that such a sky would be singularly blue for the season of the year no nature never does anything of that kind the nature makes a very great mistake that is all i have to say answered the colorist with considerable temper my dear friend interposed the realist wait a moment where should we be if we accuse nature of being in the wrong nature is never mistaken be sure of that but delacroix delacroix was an idiot you know what my opinion has always been in regard to him pardon this expression mademoiselle i merely intend to say that delacroix has had a very bad effect on his contemporaries talk to me of velasquez and i will listen to you velasquez did very well and had he known my principle of art he would have been the first of painters now with rembrandt it was different he had a dim suspicion of what i mean rembrandt he could paint with nothing but bitumen precisely he put it on everything and in everything and that is where he showed his genius his genius indeed he was a mere realist they continue to dispute showering epithets of fool and idiot and all those artists who did not happen to please them and finally one of the young men in the heat of discussion turned to bonne marie as arbitress i am very ignorant she answered with a deep blush and i really understand very little of the things you say but it seems to me that the painters of whom you speak velasquez rubens titian and rembrandt cannot be without worth since their works are in all museums and people talk of them to-day and yet they died so long ago gentlemen lower your flags you are conquered exclaimed morin in a high delight words of wisdom have dropped from mademoiselle lucien's lips bonne marie coloured again but this time with pleasure and turning away she stepped upon the platform and resumed her pose look said the colorist raising his head your doll is kicking some one must be pulling the bell come in he shouted with the voice of a stentor utterly regardless of the furious look which morin launched at him how delightful this atelier is exclaimed the newcomer as he pushed the door open no one can say you keep your guests waiting my boy and how is your precious health morin extremely surprised at this familiar greeting from a man he did not know bowed with cold politeness the unknown glanced stealthily at bonne marie who recognized him as a person whom she had noticed lately as a regular habitue of the concert room where she sang she had seen him sit the whole evening with the knob of his walking stick between his teeth and a glass stuck in one eye it was the same man she was sure only his hair at night was reddish while by daylight it took a yellower tint as to his eyes they were unchanged shining and pale blue and set very much on the outside of his head unchanged too was his inquiring smile which displayed large and prominent teeth and seemed to ask at every stupid jest uttered by himself or any one else well what do you think of that End of chapter nineteen recording by monica raleigh chapter twenty of bonne marie this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by monica raleigh bonne marie a tale of normandy and paris by henri greville translated by mary neil sherwood chapter number twenty a new aspirant the attractive person who entered the atelier of our friend morin with such scenty ceremony was not abashed by the cool reception vouchsafed to him but gaily continued hope i don't disturb you i am sure go on just as if i were not here is it possible can it be mademoiselle lucien whom i see before me what a happy chance it was which brought me this morning into the presence of the star of the champs elysees i beg ten thousand pardons for not recognizing you at once but not expecting to see you i really then too the stranger added your black dress misled me it is amazingly becoming however should you wear it to-night on the stage you would have a stupendous success i am in mourning sir 
answered bonne marie gently ah a thousand pardons mademoiselle excuse me i beg of you i am a great simpleton he need not to have told us that muttered the realist in the ear of his comrade i am a positive simpleton i ought to have seen at once mademoiselle did you were in mourning will you excuse me sir interrupted morin coldly we are at present much occupied if you would kindly return in an hour's time you would find me at leisure to attend to you and to learn from you the motive which induced you the motive interrupted the unknown the motive which brought me here is no secret it was my sincere admiration for your superb talent and the crocodile cast an insinuating glance at bonne marie that was intended to show her and her alone that he was not speaking the truth you remember me i trust my dear sir and remember the day that Morisset presented us to each other morin bowed indifferently he said to me to-day look here meluna you have a father who is a millionaire here meluna glanced again at the girl to see the effect he produced shall i tell you how to get rid of a small portion of his money buy one of morin's pictures morisset's advice my dear fellow is not always as good as this consequently i am here monsieur morisset is most kind to remember me answered the artist oh he knows your talent better than you do yourself i say that because your modesty prevents you from appreciating your talents as you should do true talent is the last to recognize itself morin whose best friends never compared him to the violet and who in no way merited this eulogy asked himself if milonard was not laughing at him but he soon satisfied himself that he was not milonard was simply repeating a phrase he had heard somewhere recently you are very flattering said the artist merely because he felt he must say something not at all not at all but i have come to purchase a canvas that bears the imprint of your name and talent morin's two friends who had listened attentively to this conversation now rose and noiselessly withdrew at this precise time i have no pictures on hand he answered so coldly that bonne marie looked up in surprise then you can paint me one one with trees and things you know like what's his name's the man i mean who paints mountebanks i never paint mountebanks morin answered as he touched his palette with the point of his brush this movement drew melinard's attention he put his glass to his eye oh perfect delicious he said showing all his teeth the living breathing image of mademoiselle lucien it looks as if she were about to speak no to sing rather and he laughed at his own wit as he twisted the silk cord that held his glass morin by this time utterly out of temper tried colour after colour without finding one to suit him he did not dare look at lucien lest he should discover that the intruder was welcome to her was it not possible that she had told him to meet her here at this thought he angrily bandished his brush in the air and then as quick as thought painted into the portrait of bonne marie which as yet was little more than a sketch the heavy moustache of an hungarian officer i like the portrait this way what do you say asked the painter turning towards his visitor the young girl annoyed and disturbed had relapsed into profound silence and was examining with her eyes the more distant objects in the room as she was at some little distance she had not seen what morin had done nor could she understand the meaning of his question the only thing she really grasped was the amazement of the simpleton before her he not knowing what to make of this bizarre act of the young artist stood with his mouth wide open and his eyes fixed his small head and slender neck were protruded from his low-cut colour which seemed to retreat like the waves when the tide is going out while his glass dangled at the end of his stiff and immovable forefinger 
bonne marie already nervous and unstrung was seized by a wild impulse to laugh she sank into an armchair threw her head back and the atelier rang with her clear rippling laughter which in the end so charmed the artist and even melunard its object that they both joined in it delicious said melunard after a few moments delicious but really you see my dear sir began morin reassured by bonne marie's laughter i am nervous as i am apt to be when i am disturbed at my work i beg ten thousand pardons i am really mortified but you will paint my picture will you not and you will allow me to come occasionally and see how it is getting on i trust i may sometimes have the very great pleasure of meeting mademoiselle here and and we shall have charming little family parties in that way muttered morin suppose we ask the concierge to come too with her mending and bring her cat and then we might cook a few chestnuts at the stove no my good sir i do not work like that i do not paint by the hour Millenard, in utter silence received this avalanche of words much as trees bear the blows of the poles that knock down their nuts he merely gathered that morin did not choose to let him see lucien in his studio and he therefore determined to see her elsewhere i regret my dear sir he exclaimed trying to effect what is known as a good retreat that you had no picture for sale i would have given a good price say fifteen hundred francs for a landscape with mountebanks interrupted morin i do not insist on the mountebanks however nor i either said the artist as he gave a finishing touch to the moustache on the portrait well then why simply said the artist hastily because i do not paint pictures to order call at the atelier on my left or the other on my right they will do anything you wish i can only regret that i have allowed you to waste your time oh not at all answered melinard naively i had nothing else to do bonne marie had the greatest difficulty in restraining another fit of nervous laughter as she met morin's eyes this most inopportune guest had at last made up his mind to depart and as he went out said with a most irresistible smile and bow addressed to lucien i will come in again on some other occasion as you seem oh it is not at all worth while answered morin with the most exquisite politeness it is always the same way with me and closing his door on this patron of the fine arts the young painter pushed the bolt and went back to his model bonne marie now laughed heartily and without restraint she laughed until the tears stood in her eyes and morin was singularly moved by this gaiety which was that of a pure and innocent child it is good to see you laugh he said as he took his seat on the edge of the platform you are like a happy child who goes to guignol for the first time guignol appeared to the young girl so happy a comparison in connection with the man who had just gone out that she laughed again finally she succeeded in checking herself somewhat ashamed of such inconsiderate mirth in the presence of a stranger an artist and a man of celebrity but what did you do to my portrait to astonish that gentleman to such a degree she asked i will show you he answered with a smile she started forward but he detained her there is plenty of time he said sit still a few moments it is so delicious to have gotten rid of that vapid fool our laugh together has made us old friends but you have not laughed or so little that it amounts to nothing my mirth has been more silent than yours possibly but it was none the less sincere for all that but tell me are we not friends i don't know answered the young girl with some hesitation it was growing late and the atelier was invaded by that peculiar grey light which comes earlier in the day to studios than to other rooms because of their north light in this twilight the room looked larger and the corners were vague and afar off the girl shivered and rose hastily but it is pleasant here said morin again detaining her yes it is pleasant but i must go it is growing late lucien 
said the young man taking her hand stay for i love you bonne marie's heart beat wildly under the folds of her black dress she waited willing to hear more i love you repeated morin will you not love me a little in return i do not know she replied guarded by the double prudence of a woman and a native of normandy will you try asked the young man possessing himself of her other hand when we know each other better answered the girl disengaging herself and in the twinkling of an eye putting on her wrap and hat au revoir she said to morin extending her hand as she stood on the threshold will you stay a while to-morrow he answered awakening from his dream no she said shaking her head smilingly she said no but morin thought she meant yes why was she so different from all the other women of her class whom he had known none of whom would have refused to linger for another hour in the soft obscurity of his dusky studio one and all would have begun by refusing and then they would have remained the next day it rained the sad cold light streamed in at the high window of the studio bringing with it a sensation of cold morin's two neighbors were as usual lounged on an interminable discussion the artist thought of going to call on the young girl but a certain feeling restrained him he was unwilling to allow her to suppose that he felt the necessity of seeing her every day as the rain continued for nearly a week the sitting seemed to have come to an untimely end the painter therefore made up his mind one evening to go to the concert room of the cafe end of chapter twenty recording by monica raleigh chapter twenty one of bonne marie this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by susanna mason bonne marie a tale of normandy and paris by henry greville translated by mary neil sherwood chapter twenty one wars and rumours of wars already the dead leaves lay in heaps under the box and privé hedges where they had been whirled by the autumnal gusts and every morning a squad of men with brooms had the greatest difficulty in clearing the champs elysees winter was near at hand and the gay room in the open air so cool and fresh with the milky globes which seemed to surround it like the setting of a jewel must be abandoned some hall must be discovered in the centre of paris where the fumes of tobacco deadened the air already exhausted by the innumerable gas burners this had been under due discussion during the day and bonne marie had felt her heart fail her at the prospect to her after the free out-of-door life to which she had been accustomed the close atmosphere of the stifling rooms was a veritable penance once when she had with difficulty obtained an hour of freedom she had gone with clotilde to the theatre and was more bewildered and uncomfortable than pleased which charmed her friend who called her from that time the pretty savage the evening that Maureen decided to go to the café, the concert troupe was in a great state of excitement. They had just been informed that the manager had taken one of the finest halls in Paris, and looked forward to a splendid season. At the end of September, that is, almost at once, they would emigrate, and a new repertoire would enchant their old public, while the old one would charm the ears of an audience who would not fail to fill the room night after night. A very important position was given to Mademoiselle Lucien, in the new arrangement, Morissette having wisely said to himself, I pay her an enormous salary and must give my money back at least. This was not altogether agreeable to other members of the troupe, and while Bonne Marie naturally accepted with joy every opportunity of appearing on the stage and being welcomed with applause, the other singers, seeing themselves cast into the shade, amused themselves in grumbling at the manager, and in saying very hateful things of this comparatively new member of their troupe. Clotilde, who at first had defended her, ended by going over to the camp of the enemy, for that morning Morissette, without notifying her or anyone else, had placed Lucien's name in large letters at the top of the placard. There was a grand revolution. The manager bore the first assault with unflinching courage. He was accustomed to such scenes, for he had seen plenty of them in his troubled career. Evening came, Bonne Marie, perfectly unsuspicious and not having seen the placard, found herself greeted by a storm of epigrams, some 
as coarse as they were cutting her new-born parisian acuteness was not as yet sufficiently developed to enable her to grasp the full meaning of all she heard she understood half however and guessed the rest calm and dignified pale with indignation and burning contempt she submitted quietly to all this sarcasm and feigned not to understand it her coldness and self-possession piqued her companions and the women sought to engage their adorers in the contest but the men were too wise to commit themselves for lucian was very pretty and it was not worth while to quarrel with her for who could say what might happen in the midst of all this marlinard came in if he had been desirous of knowing bonne marie it was because clotilde herself had inspired him with the desire clotilde was one of those women of which there are many who never can keep anything to themselves melinard who had recently become her best and most intimate friend had heard her utter the most extravagant eulogiums on mademoiselle lucien the result of which was that lucien whom he hardly knew by sight seemed to him more attractive than clotilde herself and then there was still another reason for his sudden change clotilde was horribly extravagant while lucien seemed very quiet and inclined to be economical now melinard although rich was a young man who kept a very sharp lookout for his own interests when moria entered the concert hall clotilde was singing melinard sleeping in a rickety console table was pouring gallant speeches into bonne marie's ears who hardly heard them some subtile association had carried her back to Almondville, and she was thinking of her long solitary walks on the seashore of all her ambitions dreams and hopes and of him who had suddenly appeared on her horizon and who opened the pathway to her of fortune and happiness her dream was not yet realized morin loved her but he did not love her enough to make her forget all the bitterness of life tired of the monotonous flow of melinard's words she turned towards him to answer with some jesting remark that would show him that this was the case when as she lifted her eyes she saw maureen on the threshold the young girl's heart beat more quickly with an emotion that almost overpowered her with the superstition natural to those in love and also to many who are not she regarded this sudden apparition of this young man a direct reply of providence to the questions that she had just been asking herself yes she would be happy yet the expression of joy on that fair face ought to have softened a very stern judge but clotilde who at that moment appeared by the other door was no judge whatever seeing that melinard was leaning over her friend in an attitude of adoration and catching a glimpse of the look of joy in the girl's eyes she believed herself betrayed folding her beautiful arms over her goddess-like bust she exclaimed upon my word this is delightful it is not enough it seems to take my place on the placard but you must also take my friends the other persons who were at present turned around delighted to see a nice little quarrel well started between two rival stars they had been in a perpetual state of wonder that they had so long lived in harmony your friends replied bonne marie vexed at hearing herself addressed with such scanty ceremony in the presence of morin your friends i was not aware that you knew this gentleman you are too virtuous perhaps to know such things answered clotilde but your pretence of excessive virtue deceives no one no one at all do you understand when we begin to talk of virtue answered bonne marie coldly i have nothing more to say yours brings you an income while mine places me in debt there is little family likeness in such virtues a shout of laughter was heard on all sides. Lucian, cried the callboy, Lucian, you are wanted. Bonne Marie rose hastily, but she had the whole length of the foyer to pass, and she could not avoid hearing her ex friend's last insult. When a woman is virtuous, she prefers to remain in the country than to make her appearance as a singer in a casino. That is my opinion, and I say only what everyone else thinks. Thereupon Clotilde made a scene with Melinard, who, with a hang-dog expression and dangling eyeglass, wished himself anywhere but where he was. Morin heard all this in silence. Clotilde's friendship was not a brevet of virtue for Bonne Marie, but her hatred was even less so. Besides, she insinuated that she had known for a long time much that she did not choose to say. Those ambiguous words, however, did not pain the young man. Had he never regarded Lucien as a vestal, 
although she seemed to him better educated more intelligent and infinitely more original than any of the other women of her class what did it matter to him whether she had had or had not had any adventures he was not in search of a wife after this apostrophe of clotilde's he went out calmly and posted himself at the door bonne marie after singing disappeared among the crowd of visitors in the foyer and hurried away to change her dress she dreaded to meet Morin while she was smarting under the words she had heard. Would he believe them? she asked herself. How could she exculpate herself? Anxious, unhappy, cut to the heart, sick to death of all this petty jealousy and discord, she asked for but one thing, solitude, where she might hope to recover her lost serenity. End of chapter 21 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 22 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Greville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 22 Quarrels and Insults. When she was again dressed in her simple black walking costume, she threw a veil over her hat and passed through the door devoted to the use of the concert troupe. As she, with lowered head, caring only to avoid every eye, passed hurriedly along, she felt her hand seized and drawn through an arm, and turning hastily to see who dared treat her with so little ceremony, she saw Morin. She made no objections, but let him do as he would. They walked on for some minutes in profound silence. Morin held Bonne Marie's arm pressed against his heart, and she felt herself almost borne along by his masterful strength. Her heart was very full. It was so delicious to have a master, and to feel that she was no longer alone in the world, a world so full of disappointments, jealousies, and angry suspicions. "'What was Melonard saying to you?' suddenly asked the young painter. In the last half-hour his love for Bonne Marie had taken a strong start. Before it had been a momentary caprice, but since he had heard her insulted, it had developed into a passion, and he had become suddenly jealous, not of a past in which he counted for nothing, but of a present where he wished to reign and conquer. "'I do not know what he said, some foolish thing or another,' answered Bonne-Marie. "'But Clotilde, did you hear Clotilde? I thought she loved me.' and Bonne Marie's heart swelled to bursting while the tears stood in her eyes. "'Do women ever love each other?' asked Morin philosophically. "'That idea is a delusion and a snare.' But "'I love her very dearly,' said Bonne Marie with a sob. "'You do a very unwise thing, then.' "'But she has been very kind to me.' "'Not for your own sake entirely you may wager your life. When she has done you a kindness, it was for the purpose of doing harm to someone else.' "'Do you really think so?' asked Bonne-Marie, aghast. "'I know it. She was afraid an old rival of hers would be engaged by Morissette, and managed matters in a way that you took the place which would otherwise have been hers.' "'How could you possibly know this?' asked the young girl. Morin had the best reason in the world for not answering this question, as he wished to stand high in Bonne-Marie's good graces. He could not lie altogether either, therefore he answered— one of her most intimate friends told me so. I am as certain of it as it were myself whom Clotilde had told. Bonne Marie walked along with her eyes riveted on the pavement. It was raining a little, a very little, one of those gentle autumnal showers which are as brief and soft as those in the spring, and do not demand an umbrella. The atmosphere was exquisitely fresh. Ah, and this is friendship thought the girl, half audibly. No, answered Morin, this is not friendship. It is only its lying semblance. Bonne Marie involuntarily thought of Jean Baptiste, who had for her a vastly different friendship from that of Clotilde, but his friendship again was something more. It was love. Morin, too, seemed to love her, and his love was sweet and consoling. She did not speak. "'This Melonard is an absolute idiot,' said Morin, who wished to bring affairs to a crisis. 
Yes, and how foolish he looked when he saw Clotilde come in. I recognize in him only one good quality. Melanard, a good quality? Pray tell me what it is, for I confess I have yet failed to discover that he has one. That of having had sense enough to wish to buy one of your pictures. Morin laughed heartily. But it was not for that he came. You know very well. It was on your account. Bonne Marie lifted her surprised and innocent eyes to his. He is the most tiresome person in the world, she said with a sigh. But tell me, are you so rich that you could refuse to sell him a picture? I am not at all rich. I manage to live from day to day, that is all. But when I have finished your portrait, it will be quite another thing. Then do you mean that I can be of use to you? Morin smiled and pressed his companion's arm more closely to his heart. I count on you to make my fortune, he answered. We will go down to posterity together. He is not rich, thought Bonne Marie, and yet he refused fifteen hundred francs because I was there. How disinterested! Tell me, urged Morin, shall we go down to posterity together? If you desire it answered the girl softly, in great agitation, troubled by the sense she gave to these words. They walked slowly, on for another square. "'I love you, Lucien,' resumed the painter suddenly. "'I love you to such a degree that I am ready to commit any absurdity for your sake. When that idiot was leaning over you and whispering in your ear, I was inclined to knock him down. You do not love Melinard, then?' "'Love him? What folly!' The other day, when he came to my studio in such an odd way, I thought you allowed it, or even desired it. Bonne Marie opened her lips hastily. It is jealousy, I know, he continued. There is nothing, too, more utterly foolish than jealousy, and when I am under the influence of that passion, I can be weaker and more idiotic than Melinard. The girl smiled faintly. Their eyes met. They walked more slowly through the deserted streets he had especially selected. The rain was falling faster, and the badly lighted streets were nearly deserted, and the hour was too the hour too was growing late. Morin determined to avail himself of this opportunity. You know, he said, how pleasant it is in my studio. But you cannot know how sweet it is for me to hear the rustle of a woman's dress, to feel her arms on the back of my chair, and know that she is looking at my work with me. Imagine the joy of having my pretty model before my eyes at all hours, times, and seasons, to paint when I was not, to paint when I was in the humor, when I felt the inspiration, and not when the hands of the clock point to two o'clock, or only from two to four. Think what it would be, Lucian, to hear you sing for me alone. My name is not Lucian, said the young girl suddenly. I am called Bonne Marie. Bonne Marie. "'That is infinitely prettier,' cried Maureen. "'It is poetical and fantastic. "'Whence comes this charming name?' "'It is a name common at La Hague.' "'Maureen did not even know where La Hague was, "'and she explained it to him. "'Almost unconscious that he was doing so, "'the young singer described her wild, strange country. "'Almost unconscious that she was doing so, "'the young singer described her wild, strange country.' and then went to speak of herself, of her childhood, and of all her youthful dreams. A strange longing to tell him all about herself carried her away. It seemed as if she had determined before Maureen uttered the irrevocable words that he should know all that was in her power to tell him in regard to herself. But he had no corresponding desire. He loved her in the present only, and cared little for anything else. But he listened nevertheless in delighted surprise at so much poetry in this café singer, and also by the elevated sentiment, sentiments she expressed. By the elevated sentiments she expressed. What a charming companion I should have, and what a delicious winter we might pass. By this time they had reached Bonne Marie's door. She had stood still and waited for words that came not. He moved forward to go in with her. No, no, she said. You are right, mused Morin. It is never wise to incur the risk of being uselessly compromised. Tomorrow, then, I shall expect you at the studio. Tomorrow, yes, tomorrow, said Bonne Marie gently. He extended his hand, she laid her own slender fingers lightly within it, and he held them silently and closely. Bonne Marie was also silent. 
the girl was intensely happy the happiness was the happiness so long dreamed of was now close at hand the happiness of being beloved by a man of whom she could be proud whose manners and words were elegant and refined whose mind was cultivated and whose name was de destined to be famous she dreamed of a charming home surrounded by flowers and sculptures velvety carpets and ample curtains morin had drawn her towards him the street was empty and the rain was falling quietly and persistently he leaned toward her and pressed a kiss on her hair all shining with tiny drops of rain she submitted for this fleeting caress was very dear and precious but she summoned all her strength tomorrow she repeated she pushed open the door which was never bolted until eleven and flew up to her room on the fourth floor as soon as she went and as soon as she went in she opened the window and looked out the shadow of louise morin was clearly defined on the shining pavement indifferent to the weather he walked off with a slight step as if he was the happiest of men without a care in the world he loves me he loves me and added bonne marie i love him with my whole heart and the girl was half frightened as she realized how this love was gaining possession of her whole nature she closed her window and lighted her candle and seated in the low chair she meditated long and earnestly the cracking of the glass at the base of the burnt-out candle aroused her hours later for time had seemed very short to her in the wakening dreams in which she had been absorbed no oh, she murmured as she rose with a shiver from her chair it is not remorse for a woman to love as i love him not at least if it be her husband whom she adores she was soon asleep a light sleep during which her soul seemed to preserve a consciousness of her profound happiness end of chapter 22 recording by susanna mason chapter 23 of bonne marie this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by susanna mason bonne marie a tale of normandy and paris by henry greville translated by mary neil sherwood chapter 23 hopes the next day was as balmy as if it were april over the sky of the clearest possible blue drifted white and fleecy clouds occasionally came a dark gray mass the clouds moved hurriedly along driven towards the northeast by a clear fresh wind not so quickly however as to spare the parisians more than one brief shower speedily followed however by radiant sunshine bonne marie rose early and having arranged all about her with that care and order which were all part of her character occupied herself with her toilette her simple black dress did not admit of any very great variety of combinations but the plain linen collar the knots of black ribbons at the throat and wrist the black velvet which held the braids of her magnificent hair one were all received the most careful attention at last dressed and ready long before the appointed hour she thought of her breakfast a bit of bread and a glass of milk were all she could swallow and this was a concession to established customs rather than because she wanted anything a little later than the time agreed upon for in her dread lest she should arrive too soon she went to the other extreme and was late bonne marie entered the atelier maureen was also dressed with care and attention his most becoming cravat was negligently knotted and his gorgeous bouquets of superb autumnal flowers blazed in his studio he was much less talkative than usual it is true the love he felt for the fair singer was very different from that which she felt for him nevertheless the young man was more interested than he had been for years the simple confidences made by bonne marie the evening before had shown him a nature far above the commonplace he saw now that this girl was unlike any other woman he had ever known but this conviction did not give him any idea of what she really was an honest creature led away by ambition and placed in an unhealthy atmosphere whose baseness she in no degree suspected when she entered the room bonne marie laid aside her hat and at once ascended the platform and took her seat morin made no objection a little time was necessary to both that they might control their emotions somewhat for fifteen minutes the young man painted assiduously and bonne marie bore his eyes which went from her face to the canvas and from the canvas back to her face 
in the most unflinching manner and unbroken silence. "'And your friends?' she asked at last, feeling that the painter's attention was gradually fixing itself on her rather than the picture he was painting. "'They are not coming today. Are we not happy here alone?' Silence again fell on the atelier. After a little while, Maureen made a sign to Bonne Marie. "'Come and look,' he said. The young girl obeyed and went to the easel. Yes, Morin had spoken well when he said that this portrait would be his chef d'oeuvre. Agitation and excitement had imparted to the portrait that dash of ideality to which up to that time it had lacked. Lucian, for it was not Bon Marie alone, it was the singer transfigured by the joy of success. Lucian lived on this canvas. Her deep blue eyes seemed to be looking into the space from which she drew the inspiration with which she sang. Her fair skin with its pearly lights, her masses of blonde hair and magnificent arms were all there. It was Bonne Marie, certainly, but it was Bonne Marie as she would be in a few years if she lost nothing of her purity, and if, instead of returning to her village at home, she continued to elevate herself towards the ideal of art. "'It is beautiful,' said the young girl softly, breathless before this image of herself which she hardly dared call by her own name. "'You are satisfied with it?' asked the painter, approaching her very closely. She looked at him with her whole soul in her eyes. "'I will do better than that,' resumed Morin. "'I will paint another portrait of you,' he added as he led Bonne Marie towards the small sofa. She seated herself, and he held her hand. After a few moments, while the young girl heard her heart beat so tumultuously that it seemed to her that Morin must hear it also, she, without lifting her eyes, said to him, have you a mother? Yes, answered Morin briefly. One of his first rules in life was never to speak of his family to his studio acquaintances, either men or women. This selfish fellow had a certain affection for his old home and fireside, although he never went near it. But the small provincial town where his mother and sisters vegetated was at such a distance from this all-absorbing Paris. Each year he talked of going to them in the heat of summer. I am motherless said Bon Marie softly. "'You are beautiful,' answered Morin, hardly hearing what she had said. "'You love me, and I am certain that we shall be the happiest people in the world.' Love and happiness were the words she constantly heard. But why did he say nothing of marriage? The girl felt sick at heart. It seemed to her she was choking. She turned her plaintive eyes towards the artist. He misunderstood their expression. "'You have suffered, my poor child.' he said as he slipped his arm round her waist. Bonne Marie made no resistance. Indeed, so entirely was she absorbed in listening for the words she longed to hear that he, she hardly knew it. "'Men are selfish, and men are wicked,' continued the young artist. "'But my love has neither of those qualities. Mine will never wound you, and there is nothing of the tyrant in my nature, as you will soon see.' Bonne Marie did not speak. One by one, all the fair hopes that had grown and blossomed in the last few weeks fell like the dead leaves which the autumnal wind blew against the window from the garden. The garden so fresh and gay, so short a time before, and now so cold and mournful under the shadow of grey clouds which had obscured the sun. Morin became, all at once, very anxious. Before possessing himself further of the girl's affections, he determined to ascertain all the particulars of her fall. The fall from virtue, which of course must have been the reason of her coming to Paris. Was it some vulgar rustic who had betrayed her, or some man like himself who had met her on the Normandy sands? "'He deserted you, then?' he asked the girl in a soothing, tender voice. "'Who?' she asked with a start of pain and surprise, for she felt a vague presentiment of evil." He whom you loved, before you came here, I mean. I never loved any one, she answered, rising hastily from her seat. No one, ah, no one, she repeated with a look of anguish directed towards the sky, where the swift clouds banking up reminded her of the sudden tempest of her own land. So much the better, then, resumed Morin, as he took her hand to draw her back to her seat at his side. He thought she merely meant to say that she had learned when it was too late that she had never really loved the man for whose sake she had left her village. "'You will love me all the better now, my dearest, for you do love me, do you not?' "'Yes, I love you,' she answered, her tender eyes full of pain and surprise, as she looked at him. "'I love you far more than I wish I did.' 
Why this sadness, Lucian? Is not life full of pleasant things? Let us not look back on a past that is sad, but think only of the future that opens rosy before us. The future, repeated Bonne Marie, but the future is so uncertain. People die and are married. She stopped short with half-parted lips, waiting, apparently, for a reply. Oh, replied Morin lightly, when I marry, if I ever marry at all, it will be so many years from now that it is not worth while speaking of it. A faint sigh was heard through the absolute silence of the studio. Bonne Marie had foreseen this cruel reply, and had armed herself to support it with courage. She succeeded. Her dream was shattered, and the ruins seemed about to swallow her up, but her indomitable pride gave her strength. "'You love me?' she said, her sweet voice trembling slightly, for this hour was one of the most cruel of a life that had known much sorrow." I adore you, Lucien, or Bonne Marie, rather, answered the painter enthusiastically. Have you ever loved any one but me? the girl asked with sad sweetness. Jealous already, and of the past, too, Morin answered with a smile. Answer me, the girl repeated. Come now, Lucien, let us be serious. Do you suppose a man reaches my age without having left a little of his fleece on the briars? But she said slowly it is not quite fair for i have never loved any one but yourself morin thought this scene was becoming somewhat monotonous but stifling his growing ennui he tried to take bonne marie in his arms she drew back more in sorrow than in anger i am a poor girl she said slowly without friends and without fortune i was led here by ambition I wished to marry above my sphere and be rich. I see now that I have made a terrible mistake. But I do not intend to be guilty of more than this. No man has ever touched my lips, and here Morin, vexed by the tone which this interview, begun so well, now assumed, made a little gesture which the girl understood only too well. You do not believe me, I see, she said sadly. And yet I do not know what I have done to deserve your bad opinion. But my child, urged Morin, trying to soothe her, I have not a bad opinion of you, on the contrary. But you believe I have had a lover, cried the girl in passionate indignation. Confound it all, muttered Morin. And you wish to take his place? Listen to me, mademoiselle, said the young man, considerably out of patience rising in his turn and taking a few rapid strides up and down the studio. "'We have nothing to do with all this,' he continued. "'I met you in a place where certainly morality is not too rigid, if you will allow me to say so. I have spoken to you as men speak to women in such places. With more respect, I admit, than is altogether the rule. You inspired me with sentiments which I believe to be lasting, and know to be sincere. Now, what on earth does it matter what I think and believe of your past, when I tell you in all frankness that I adore you and wish to make you love me? You are right, sir, said Bonne Marie with lowered head. It was I who was in the wrong to take the stage of a café concert for a pedestal. She took up her hat, which she had tossed on a chair, and put it on hastily. Lucian, exclaimed Morin, I beg of you to lay aside this childishness. I adore you. I cannot live without you. I love you, answered Bonne Marie, in a choked voice and with tears in her eyes. I love you with all my heart and with all my strength, but I shall never give myself to any man but my husband. Farewell. You will never know how I have loved you. She opened the door. Her husband, thought the young man. She must be mad. Lucian! he exclaimed, rushing toward her. She waved him back with such dignity that he stood as if petrified. "'Respect her whom you do not wish to marry,' she said coldly. "'Think of me sometimes. I have had some happy hours here.' Her voice broke, and Bonne Marie looked around the studio, so carefully arranged for her visit. She saw the easel from which her picture smiled, all those objects now so familiar and with which she had associated so many a dream of happiness. Then she turned again towards Morin, who stood gnawing his moustache, 
not knowing what to say. Yes, I have loved you, she repeated, with the desperate frankness of one who is dying and who cares for nothing more in this world. No one will ever love you as much again. I have loved you as a woman loves a man whom she is ready to consecrate her life. Not thus have you loved me. Lucian, cried Morin, rushing toward her. Adieu, she repeated, and the door closed upon her. To rush down the stairs after her, to overtake her in the courtyard before the eyes of all the neighbors and the concierge, was to expose her and himself to infinite ridicule, and Morin was especially sensitive to ridicule. In fact, he feared nothing in the world half so much. He did not cross his threshold, nor make any attempt to follow her, therefore, the more, too, that a tremendous shower at that moment dashed against his window. End of chapter 23 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 24 of Bon Marie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason Bon Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Greville Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood Chapter 24 A Surprise Louis Morin's feelings while he roamed restlessly up and down his studio, and the rain thundered on his roof and poured down the gutters past his window, were not especially agreeable or comforting. He was by no means proud of his conduct towards Lucian, but then her pretensions were so utterly absurd. "'Marry her,' said the young man, kicking over a chair, and then a footstool, which were in his path. "'I hardly know her. That is to say, I know nothing about her, whence she came, nor even how she came. It is possible she tells the truth, and that she has never loved any one. And yet Clotilde told me he, only the other day that she had a story. No, no, she is a mere adventuress, and hopes to make me marry her yet. If Louis Morin had thought for a moment, he could have seen that were Lucian an adventuress, her aims were not very high in choosing him for a victim, inasmuch as he was neither prince nor millionaire, and for a beautiful creature like that, who, if she were what he supposed, must estimate her beauty at its full value, to throw herself at the head of a painter, without any special reputation or fortune, and who was in all probability exiled for ever from the academy, it must be that some little love and disinterestedness were involved. Finally, some dim idea of this truth penetrated his selfish heart and brain, for he said aloud at last, as if in conclusion of all his meditations. It can't be helped. She may be right, but all the same men don't take their wives from the boards of a café concert. Having settled the difference between himself and his conscience by this decision, he went towards Bonne Marie's portrait, which he stood and examined in spite of the waning light. Unconsciously influenced by the idea he had just announced, his imagination converted the dreamy, poetical face of this portrait into another bolder and sensual. The lovely eyes were enlarged by a little India ink, grew cold and hard. The lips were painted. Lucian was no longer the Bonne Marie whom he had depicted. She was a beautiful woman, audacious and piquant. No, no, men do not take their wives from the boards of a café concert, he repeated as he dressed for dinner. As the evening wore on, Morin was seized with a strong desire to go and hear Lucian sing. He said to himself that it was hard for the poor girl, after a day like this, to be compelled to appear that evening, for, although he thought her extremely bold and presuming in attacking his dearly loved bachelor liberty, he was yet quite conscious of her many great merits, and he realized her entire sincerity. She had said farewell in a tone which he never heard before from human lips, a tone of almost despair and suddenly he recalled the lines of one of the ballads he had heard her sing so often, the one in which she had in fact achieved her first success. J'écoute ma soeur en vocaux, pour venir dans la grande ville. And the rich velvety tones of her touching voice stirred the innermost depths of his heart, and reproached him for his selfishness and hardness, for all the faults which belonged to him as a man of the world. He was unwilling to yield to his desire, however, for to return to the casino was to prove to Lucian that he had not the strength to stay away, and that he feared to lose her. Now, has it not been asserted that he who stands firm the longest and yields last is the stronger of the two? 
In marriage it may be different, but Morin had nothing to do with marriage. Therefore he stood firm until half-past ten, and then, as by the merest accident be it understood, he found himself on the champs Elysees. He made the judicious reflection that nothing was easier than for him to see Lucien, and she not to see him, as he need not take a seat, but could keep in the centre of the crowd. The rain had ceased to fall, the wind had gone down, but it was very cold, very cold, and Morin shivered at the thought that Lucien was at that moment probably exposed to this keen air as she sang with uncovered shoulders. With an anxiety, therefore, that surprised himself, he entered the enclosure, which he found almost empty. The concert had closed almost an hour earlier than usual. "'Why was that?' he asked of an acquaintance whom he met. "'Because Lucien did not appear to sing to-night. Her absence was unexpected, and they had no one to supply the deficiency.' "'Lucien did not sing?' repeated Morin anxiously. "'And why?' "'No one knows, and there seems, in fact, to be a world of excitement about it. The manager has lost his head, apparently, for they did not even make the usual announcement, in consequence of indisposition, etc.' The audience were displeased, and they hissed and shouted. You too? Oh, yes, I did my part. I am an old philosopher, but a little excitement stirs the blood and refreshes one sometimes. Morin heard no more. He crossed the champs Elysees and went directly to Lucien's house, so disturbed that he did not even think to take a carriage. He reached the door, but just as he was about to ring, he crossed the street and looked up at the windows. Lucien's were all black. One of them was open, and part of the white curtain was waving in the wind. This muslin troubled Morin. It seemed to him a sinister augury, and looked like feminine drapery suspended over some black abyss. He returned to the door and rang violently. "'Mademoiselle Lucien,' he said to the concierge. "'She is gone,' the woman answered sulkily. "'Where was the use of speaking politely to Lucien's visitors now?' "'Gone?' This was at least better than if the word dead had greeted Morin's ears, and so great had been his fears that this was an absolute relief. He choked a little, and then said in an indistinct voice, "'Where has she gone?' "'She did not tell me, sir. Would you kindly close that door as you go out, for a frightful draught blows through?' Instead of departing in obedience to this polite dismissal, Morin went into the room and laid a five-franc piece on the table before the concierge, saying as he did so, "'You do not know where she is gone because she did not say, but you can at least tell me whether she went on foot or not.' The sight of this shining silver piece annihilated, apparently, the frightful draught, for the old woman made no further allusion to it. "'She went away in a carriage, sir,' she replied in honeyed accents. "'Had I known you would have cared to know, I could have easily heard the address she gave the coachman. The coachman took down her trunk, she paid all she owed, and went off as quietly as possible. With her trunk, repeated Morin. And at what hour was that? Half past seven, or it might have been a quarter of eight. Morin reflected for a moment. She had gone, and it was to fly from him, of course. But, equally of course, it was a mere caprice. She would never leave her brilliant position and her enthusiastic public in this way, merely to annoy a lover who had displeased her. Did she leave no letters? Ah, this concierge did not know. But in the hope of another five-franc piece, she proposed to go and see if Mademoiselle had left nothing in her apartment. Morn accepted this offer eagerly, and as she went up the staircase, he followed, without any objection from her. The door of the apartment was swinging in the air from one open window, while the others rattled dismally. The old woman closed the door, on account of the draught, and, drawing a match from her pocket, she rubbed it on the delicately tinted paper of the salon, and by this insufficient light looked for a candle. The candle was there, and faintly lighted the faded carpet and ordinary furniture Bonne Marie had thought so pretty, when full of childish joy she first took possession of the place. Alas, it was clear that she was gone, and gone with no intention of return. The chest of drawers were empty and open. Bits of ribbon and an old glove or two with some torn paper were all that was left. There was no letter. They looked everywhere, even on the bed so carefully made. She evidently did not intend to be traced and followed. "'It is very odd,' muttered the concierge. 
very odd indeed for before mademoiselle lucien came here there was a pretty little lady with eyelashes a yard long and she did not go away without taking care to leave her address for more gentlemen than one the coarse laugh of the concierge, the thought that the lady with eyelashes a yard long had once inhabited this room, which was to him like a chamber of death, cut to Morin's heart. He handed the woman another silver piece and went down the stairs with the greatest possible haste. He crossed the street again and looked up. The window was closed by the care of the concierge, and the curtain no longer flapped in the wind. It seemed to Morin that Bonne Marie had, had gone entirely out of his life which would henceforth be as monotonous and commonplace as it had been before he knew her. The young painter went slowly back to his room. End of chapter 24 Recording by Susanna Mason Chapter 25 of Bon Marie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Susanna Mason Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy and Paris by Henry Greville, translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 25 Lucian's Letter The studio was very dark. A gas burner turned down very low, lighted it but dimly. Here and there, in this shadow, was a white outlined. But Morin knew his way, and he threaded the wilderness of chairs and tables, and reached his own especial divan, as he dropped upon it. And as he dropped upon it, he remembered with a pang that she had sat there at his side that very morning. It was there she stood as she uttered that touching farewell, and he at the time had willfully closed his eyes and ears to the truth that she loved him truly, so truly that she would not lose his respect, too truly to be only a passing intruder in the young man's life, and she was gone. "'But I will find her again,' murmured Morin, who never allowed a gloomy thought to remain in his mind long. "'Tomorrow I cannot fail to find some trace of her.' He turned to light the studio lamp that, might examine her, that he might examine her portrait, but a strange reluctance withheld his hand. He was afraid of himself. "'Tomorrow, by daylight,' he said aloud, "'one is braver when the sun shines.' The next day he entered his atelier just as a letter was handed him. This letter came from Lucian. He knew it as soon as he saw it. The writing was very careful, like those of persons who write but rarely, but regard it as an act of the greatest importance. He opened it, read it, and sat motionless as if struck by some fatal blow. "'You do not love me enough,' said the young girl, "'and I love you so much that I should end by despising myself. "'I am worthy of being the wife of an honest man, "'and I have never done anything to forfeit that right.' I told you this, but you did not believe me. I was ambitious and wished to marry into a class far above that in which I was born, and where I should have been content. The means I took were unwise. I understand that now, since they cost me your esteem. But I did not know when I appeared on the stage of the concert room at the café that I should pass for just that which I am not. Had you loved me enough, I should have made you a faithful and devoted wife. This, however, not being God's will, I return to my native village, which I shall never leave again. Do not try to find me, for even if you were to succeed, it would not be Lucian, but Bonne Marie you would meet, and it was not she, but Lucian, whom you loved. Lucian is dead, and will never sing again. The light rustle of a dry and withered leaf falling from a tree aroused the young painter. He went to the easel, lifted the green serge that covered the portrait, and looked at it with involuntary respect. Yes, Lucien was dead, and this portrait was all that remained of her. It was she, smiling, sweet and pale, her lips lightly parted with that wonderful expression which made her so marvellously beautiful as she sang. The semi-education of Bonne Marie rendered her especially susceptible to the influence of these ballads. Their sentimental platitudes were not such to her, for she had not been accustomed, like most Parisians, to turn everything into a jest. She sang these simple verses with her whole heart and soul. She wept with those deceived and disappointed maidens, with anxious mothers, and with the betrothed of sailors and soldiers. All these sentiments, which are absurdly expressed in so many ballads of the day, assumed, when uttered by her lips, an expression of sincerity and reality that was very touching. 
Morin looked at this picture long and intently. He had painted her with lifelike reality, even to the hands which were a little large and slightly red, and which he had not permitted her to glove, pretending not without reason that hands have a physiognomy as well as faces. The face, whose undercurrent of melancholy he had caught, seemed to him to have a resigned expression, which was new to him. No, he had not painted the triumphant singer as he had intended, but had depicted Bonne Marie, Bonne Marie, who had dreaded to lose his love and respect, and who had exiled herself on the day she knew the sad truth. His heart was full of bitter regret and self-reproach. He realized his brutality of the previous day. He knew he had wounded his pride and the self-respect and the heart of this young girl, but that he could ever know the depth of these wounds was quite impossible. For men constituted like himself are incapable of divining such mysteries. They only understand the wounds of the epidermis. But Morin understood that he had hurt her, that she pardoned him, and that he should see her no more. It is my chef he murmured as he regarded his work with artistic eyes and took up his palette to finish this head which was to give him a name. Poor Bonne Marie! At this very moment she was weeping bitterly in a church at Cherbourg, which she had entered to shield herself from impertinent curiosity while waiting for the hour to take the stage. She wept for the love she had lavished on Morin, love that had been so totally misunderstood and unappreciated but she felt no anger and no desire for revenge she was utterly crushed but resigned it was my own work she said the result of my own obstinacy and i am rightly punished end of chapter 25 recording by susanna mason Chapter 26 of Bonne Marie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susanna Mason. Bonne Marie, A Tale of Normandy in Paris by Henry Greville. Translated by Mary Neal Sherwood. Chapter 26 The Return. It was quite late and very dark when the yellow stage halted at Amonville. One by one, the passengers had been dropped along the road. No curious eyes had sought to penetrate the thick crape veil that covered Bonne Marie's hat and face. Either voice or accent was so changed that the driver had not recognized her. She asked him to take care of her trunk until the next day. He consented, supposing her to be a city lady on a visit to some country friend, and Bonne Marie found herself alone in the path that led to her father's little cottage. She opened the door with a trembling hand. A thousand recollections brought tears to her eyes and a choking sensation to her throat, when the familiar air of the dwelling met her as she entered. Mechanically she found in the darkness the things she needed, but the wick of the antique lamp was dry, and there was no oil in the dusty can. She found a candle in her travelling bag and lighted it. Ah! she exclaimed aloud, as a great weight seemed to be lifted from her heart. Ah! why did I leave my dear home? Why did I dream of any other destiny? I am alone in the world. Tears streamed from her eyes. Alone, without lover, friends, or family. She threw her traveling cloak on the bed, and yielding to the despair that overwhelmed her, she sank on the hearthstone and laid her head on her father's armchair, and wept as if her very heart would break. Every evening before he went to his bed, when he was on the shore, Jean-Baptiste passed Bonne Marie's home more than once. He would examine each window sadly, and then turn his face towards his own solitary dwelling, less sad at heart, for it was something to have seen the house. On the night of Bonne Marie's arrival, he did as usual, and thought himself dreaming when he saw the lights in the lower room. He went closer and rubbed his eyes. Yes, the window was lighted, but for the peculiar situation of the house whose front faced the water, while Almondville lay in the rear, the whole village would have been unaware of this startling event. Jean-Baptiste had not much faith in ghosts, and yet it was with a certain superstitious terror that he lifted the latch. The door opened, and he saw the young girl kneeling in front of her father's chair. The nervous strength of the evening before, which had given her the courage to depart, had now deserted her. She was weeping, helplessly feeling herself a rudderless ship, driven on the shore in a tempest. She did not hear the latch, and Jean-Baptiste closed the door and stood silently looking at her. 
His face blazed with savage joy. I knew it, he thought with an emotion that was almost vindictive. I knew she would return with that haughty head bowed. We are not good enough for her. She wanted city people, and I fancy she does not like them as much as she did. Bonne Marie wept on. Sobs shook her slender frame. She had ceased to struggle, and only wished that when her tears were exhausted she could fall on the hearthstone and sleep, or die. To the first fierce joy of seeing her vanquished succeeded in Jean Baptiste's heart an intense pity for the poor girl. He said to himself that she would never take the trouble to rise from that spot, and he started forward to assist her. Bonne Marie heard his footfall, and, much startled, lifted her head and recognized in that hale and hearty fisherman the friend of her childhood, he who had watched over her, with her father, from her earliest childhood. The joy of being no longer alone, of seeing that there was yet one friend left to her, gave her new life. She rushed towards him with half-extended arms, and fell on the sailor's breast like a bird who comes back to its nest. "'You are here, then,' said the young man gravely. "'You are here. Did they give you any harm?' "'Jean-Baptiste,' the girl murmured through her tears. I have no one but you. You have no one but me, but can I look on you as I did when you went away? If your father were living now, would you dare to look him in the eyes? This was the second time in two days that this insulting doubt had been thrown in her face. Unconsciously to himself, Jean-Baptiste sat in judgment upon her. He had been sure that she would return eventually, but he had not expected her so soon, and his jealousy took precedence for the moment of his tenderness. But Bonne Marie, not loving Jean Baptiste, could defend herself. If I had anything to blush for, she said, her tears suddenly ceasing to flow, do you think I would have run to meet you? You were the last man I would have been willing to see. He folded his arms around her with an air of proprietorship. I believe you, he said simply, for you never lied to me. She disengaged herself from his embrace and seated herself in the great armchair while he stood before her. How changed she was, and yet the change was indefinable. But the girl's air and manner seemed to create new barriers between them. Silence reigned in the dingy room, a silence first broken by Jean Baptiste. You are hungry and cold, he said, and I am going to make you comfortable. He disappeared and presently returned, bringing wood and his own supper. The fire soon blazed and crackled, warming the chilled walls and giving a more cheerful aspect to this sad dwelling. Bonne Marie tried to eat something, but she could not. "'You need sleep,' he said. "'I am going to make a fire for you above.' He ran up the narrow staircase, and she heard him a moment later making a fire and arranging the furniture. She saw him go out several times in return, but her thorough exhaustion prevented her from troubling herself in regard to what he was doing. She felt she had drifted into port, and had found a friend, and this, for the moment, was quite enough. She did not need to look further.' Finally, Jean-Baptiste came to her, and lifted her as if she had been a child, and bore her to the room above, where he placed her in a chair. This cleanly room told of a young girl whose home it had long been. It told of a life of self-denial and poverty, and was in strong contrast to that which Bonne Marie had just left. And yet how the sight of every familiar object went home to her heart. She thanked Jean-Baptiste softly. He said good night and withdrew. The fire burned with a joyous crackling sound. The window curtains had been hastily shaken clear of the dust that had accumulated. The pitcher was filled with fresh water, and the floor was swept. In a corner stood the trunk which he had gone to find. How good was the heart of this man whom she had repulsed and despised, and who had, notwithstanding, taken all that maternal care for her comfort. She was almost tempted to call him back and thank him, but she thought him far away for she could not hear a sound. She opened her trunk, took out some few things she needed, and was soon lying on her couch, weary and heart-sore, and yet with a strange feeling of rest and security in her heart. End of chapter 26 Recording by Susanna Mason